AV risk really needs to be assessed broadly. And I think everyone realizes as people get older, cardiovascular risk increases, that's self-evident. Uh, but what has become increasingly common, perhaps a bit distressing, is an awareness of cardiovascular disease, even in younger people. For example, within the Mass General Brigham Healthcare System, Dr. Ron Blankstein is running a Young MI registry where we're looking at outcomes of people under 50 that come in with a myocardial infarction, a heart attack. And as it turns out, there's really a lot of under treatment of risk factors in that population. That is a pretty significant number of those people have issues with elevated LDL cholesterol that's been known and documented for a while, but not treated. And I'm not necessarily saying that that's the doctor or healthcare system's fault. It could just be a patient that feels great that doesn't want to take their statin. But then when we see what happens to some of these patients coming in with a heart attack in early age, it just helps buttress, I think, the overall message of the importance of prevention. The whole idea is to prevent that event. Once the event's happened, it's a little bit easier to identify, yes, this patient needs aggressive secondary prevention. Uh, so in some respects, primary prevention is a bit trickier, as I alluded to before as well, convincing someone that otherwise feels well and perceives themselves as healthy, that they need to make lifestyle changes that can be challenging uh, from a personal perspective and or need to take medicines, including potentially prescription branded medicines that have costs. So you know, very complex trying to get people to reduce risk in the secondary prevention setting and even more so, I think, in the primary prevention setting. But uh, the young is an, uh, is an area where it turns out uh, there's uh, cardiovascular disease that's often missed or underappreciated. Similarly, uh, this was something recently published in uh, JAMA, uh, where we observed that rural folks are having uh, burgeoning rates of cardiovascular disease, including in folks that are middle-aged. So. That's a population that is often overlooked in the U.S., uh, those uh, receiving rural health care with their uh, many disparities as well. And of course, um, you know, various minority populations, one needs to be aware of particular risks and concerns there uh, and uh, under treatment as well that has been evidenced uh, as well. Uh, one needs to factor in sex, uh, that is uh, male and female sex, where the incidence of cardiovascular disease and coronary artery disease in particular is higher in men than women when one adjusts for age. Uh, male sex is, of course, still considered a risk factor for coronary artery disease, but we shouldn't allow that to let us undertreat or underappreciate coronary artery disease or cardiovascular disease more broadly in women because, of course, as women get older in particular, uh, there is a lot of heart disease and it's still one of the leading killers in women. So uh, I guess ultimately then I think it's important just to be vigilant for cardiovascular disease in everyone, but in those special populations I mentioned, maybe to do a double or triple check to make sure something hasn't been overlooked. When to go for specialty care is often a tricky question. It depends on the region of the world a person is living in, the healthcare system they're in, the health care uh, uh, payment system that they might have to deal with. So there's not a one-size-fits-all answer, but at least in the U.S., specialty care is very common, very prevalent, at least in urban areas, not necessarily in rural areas. And I think there's a lot that cardiovascular specialists can add to preventive care. Now, much of primary prevention must occur, has to occur in the primary care setting. There's just too many patients. There's no way to send them all to cardiologists, for example, if they've got elevated blood pressure or elevated cholesterol. So really the first line of attack has to be the primary care physician. But after that, I think for more complex cases, referral to a cardiologist or other appropriate specialist, might be an endocrinologist, uh, might be a nephrologist, uh, is really in order. So if it is hard to control LDL, well, then it's time to refer to a lipid clinic. And if it's a patient that has multiple statin intolerances and, and has an indication and an appropriate indication, an evidence-based indication to be on a statin, well, the right thing to do isn't just to throw up your hands and say, oh, well, I guess we can't do anything here. But there to refer on to a lipid clinic where they may have different tricks to get that patient who is apparently statin intolerant on a statin, maybe a different statin, a lower dose, an alternative dosing regimen, maybe every other day, or on other LDL lowering therapies. Acetamide, of course, I would uh, say should be in the primary care 
uh, armamentarium, but then PCSK9 inhibitors there, I think that should require a referral to a subspecialist. That's probably something that primary care physicians aren't necessarily going to want to initiate, especially given some of the payment hassles there in terms of pre-authorization and, and so forth. So there, a specialized lipid clinic uh, might be most appropriate to identify who actually needs a PCSK9 inhibitor and then figure out how to actually get it to the patient in a way that is hopefully cost effective. So uh, that's one example of how subspecialty care can help. Same with diabetes, where that's a potent risk factor for cardiovascular disease. That's something that primary care physicians deal with every day. But for more complex diabetes and polypharmacy and complications of diabetes, there I think referral to an endocrinologist can be quite useful for hypertension that is seemingly difficult to control, resistant sometimes is a word that gets thrown around out there. I think referral to a cardiologist who specializes in hypertension or a nephrologist who has an interest in that area can be useful. Again, many times it's just a matter of getting the patient on medicines that are already out there available, oftentimes generic, uh, but sometimes it requires escalation of care in terms of the types of medicines that are used or the combinations that are used. So uh, some tricks up the sleeve that folks that specialize in that area might have. Uh, I guess the bottom line then is for common risk factors, even though there's commonality, even though there's medicines that everybody knows about for them, uh, some cases are tough to control for a variety of reasons and their referral to a subspecialist can be very useful.